All right. Uh, morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, and uh, we thank God for another Sunday. Uh, another beautiful Sunday. It's a great weather, and God is so good. And uh, we're just grateful to God for all his blessings this week. And um, we're thankful to him for some wonderful praise reports that we received. There have been people that we've been praying for and we've had in our prayers uh, for some time. And uh, God has been so good. They've been released uh, from hospital. And we, we are trusting that the healing that the Lord has started, that God will complete. Amen. Amen. amen amen so our message this morning is entitled what would jesus say what would jesus say now there's this very popular wristband that has wwjd on it which means what will jesus do and oftentimes believers will have that wristband on their hands as a reminder uh, to themselves that no matter the situation they find themselves in no matter what circumstances they find themselves in, that wristband that has what would Jesus do is almost like a reminder, a refresher, a pointer to say, wherever I am in or wherever I am at, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus respond in this situation? Um, and the whole idea, I believe, of that, of that wristband is to guide our believers and to remind I believers to live lives in a way that would glorify and honor and reflect the character of Jesus. But our message this morning is titled, What Would Jesus Say? And I really think that it has the same motivation behind it. Because the focus of our message this morning is that on the day we stand before Jesus, on this day we stand before God, on the day we have to stand before him, to give an account, what are the words that we would like to hear him say to us? On the day we all stand before the Lord to give an account, what are the words that we would want to hear him say to us? Now, there's some important realities that we have to come to terms with. There's some important realities that we have to accept. And the first reality is that eternity is real. Eternity is a very, very, very real thing. Eternity is real, and this life, this world is temporary. But so often we've been fooled into believing that this world will continue forever. And as human beings, we scarcely give any thought at all to eternity. Hardly any thought. We prepare a lot more for the things of this world and the things we want to do in this life and we give very little thought oftentimes to what happens to us when we leave this world. The most important decision. You find that the way human beings live their lives, you will see that they hardly give very little thought. Very little thought to what happens when we leave this world. And meanwhile, eternity is real. The second reality that we have to come to terms with is that one day all of us will have to stand before God to give an account. I need that to sink in for a second. Every single human being, every single man and woman, we must stand before God. We must stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account. To tell God how we have used our life, our resources, our, our blessings, our time for his glory. We have to give an account. He's going to ask us. We have to give an account how we have used the things he has blessed us with for his glory. All of us. When we read 2 Corinthians 5.10, it makes it very clear. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says to us, in fact, from verse 9, it says, Therefore we make it our aim, this is Paul speaking, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, whether we are alive or not, to be pleasing to him. We make it our aim. We make it our objective. The number one objective in my life, as per Paul, is to be pleasing to him, to be pleasing to Christ. 
Why? Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You see that? Oh, we must all appear. There is a day that has been appointed by God that every single human being, all of us must stand and appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That what? That each one, not together, that each one may receive the things done in the body. So the things that we have done while we are alive, the things that we have done while we have breath, the things that we have done while we are in this world, we will receive a reward according to what we have done. It says according to what he has done, whether good or bad. He goes on to say in verse 11 that, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. So he's saying that given the, 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 the gravity of this day, Given the seriousness of this day, two things. We have to remember that we are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive what we have done and to receive a reward for what we have done, how we have lived for Christ, with Christ. And because we know the gravity of this day, he's saying as, as a believer, right, that what? We are persuading men. We are turning men to Christ. We are pointing men to Christ to say, listen, return to the Lord. Make right with God. So the reality is that eternity is real. We have to stand before God to give an account as per this verse. And on that day, Jesus is going to say something to each of us. He's going to say something to each of us. He's going to utter words to each of us. There's something he's going to say to every single one of us. And what he's going to say is not only going to determine our eternal destiny, but what he's going to say on that day cannot be reversed. The moment he utters those words, it cannot be taken back. The moment he utters those words, we can no longer plead with him. The moment he says those words, there is no court of appeal. It's final. And the words of Christ on that day when we stand before him will determine our eternal destiny. So our reading for this morning is from Matthew 25, 14 to 29. And it's the well-known parable of the talents. And what it really is, is a picture of what every soul will experience on that great day. What we're going to see in this passage is that for those who have Christ, for those who have surrendered their lives to Christ, who are living for him, it is very clear in this passage that there will be joy for all eternity. In fact, as believers, we should be looking forward to that day. We should be looking forward and anticipating that day. Because on that day, we put down our sword. Every battle that we have gone through and fought in this life is over. Every pain and every sorrow and every sacrifice we have made for the Lord is done. That is the day where we are rewarded for our efforts, our commitment, our devotion, and our sacrifice. So we should look forward to that day with joy. To see that look on the face of Jesus where he tells us the words that we want to hear. Well done. Well done. So for believers who have truly given their lives to God, who have surrendered their hearts to God, who have put him first, it will be joy for all eternity. There's a second group. For those without Christ. For those who have not truly surrendered, for those not living for him, for those who have no interest in the things of God or the purposes of God in this life, 
what this passage shows us is that it will be sorrow for all eternity. But like I said, as believers, we need to be looking forward to that day with joy. We need to be looking forward to that day with anticipation. <clears throat> so as we read our passage this morning, the question that I want all of us to be asking ourselves is simply this. On that day when I, not when we, not when me and my family, not when me and my spouse, not when me and my father or my mother, not when me and my children, not when me and my friends, but when I, I, me, an individual, when, I, when it comes to my turn and I stand before Christ, the creator of the universe, and he looks down on me and he asks me to give an account of how I have lived my life, what I have done with my life, what I have done with the, what he has blessed me with, my time, my resources, my effort, my devotion, my love. When he asks me and says, give an account of what you have done with your life. The question we have to ask ourselves this morning is simply this. What do we want Christ to say to us? What do I want him to say to me? What are the words I want to hear from his mouth as I stand before him? Because I believe that if we think about that question every single day, if we think about the question and ask ourselves, what would Jesus say? And allow that question to be our motivation. It will actually change how we live our lives. And it will help us to live our lives in such a way that brings glory to the name of God. And it will help us to realign ourselves and to live our lives not in the context of this world alone, but in the context of eternity. In the context of eternity. Eternity. Not this life. Eternity. I said in the very beginning, eternity is more real. It is more real than this life. It is more real than the things that we see around us. The Word of God says this again and again and again. Everything we see is going to pass away. Everything. But eternity is real. The soul will live for all eternity, whether with God or away from God. And there is no coming back. There is no returning. The moment that person steps from here to eternity, that is the end of it. There is no recourse, there is no second try, there is no court of appeal, there is nothing else that can be said or done. That is it. And the sad thing is that this world, this life, whether you live 70 years or 100 years, is a blip on the screen. It's a blip, a blip on the screen. A dot. And it's so sad that we allow ourselves and this world to deceive us. We put so much energy, so much people. They put 99% of their efforts, their thoughts, their, their concerns into the things of this world that will pass away. And don't give a second thought about eternity. So what excuse are we going to give God? What are we going to say to him? So as we read the message this morning, the question that I have to ask myself first and foremost, the question that you have to ask yourself, is not if I stand before Christ. It's when I stand before Christ. When I have to give an account when I have to tell him what I did, why I did it. What are the words that I want him to say to me? Because when we think like that, it will change how we live. 
Now, as I say this, I'm also mindful of the fact of what the Bible says. When the word is sown, what happens? The enemy is going to come immediately and try and take that word away from the heart so that the word is unfruitful. We said that last week. But this morning, I am challenging myself. We need to challenge ourselves and say, what is it that I want Christ to say to me? Because he will say something. He's going to utter certain words. And once those words leave his lips, there is no going back. So let's read our passage in Matthew 25, 14 to 30, and then we'll get into the message. Matthew 25, 14 to 30, the parable of the, of the talents. It says, for the kingdom of heaven, this is Christ speaking, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants. So mark that. This man is traveling, he called his own servants, his own servants, not outsiders, his own servants, and delivered his goods to them. Verse 15, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Verse 16. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. Now mark this, verse 18. But he who had received one, one talent, went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. He hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. You see that? Mark that again. He settled accounts. He settled accounts. He called them to himself to give an account of how they have used what he has given them. Verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, mark these words, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You see that, that the master is pleased with the servant. The master is pleased with this man because he did something with what the master had given him. He got to work. He was busy about the master's business. Verse 22. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Verse 24, then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered the seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. He did absolutely nothing with what God had given him. Now look at these words here. He says, look, there you have what is yours. Look, there you have what is yours. You gave me one talent, that's your one talent back. Now this is the passage where we have to pay attention to. Verse 26. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and that my coming out have received back my own interest. What, what, what is being said there is that at the very least, there is at least something you could have done 
something you could have done to advance my business, to advance my cause, but you did not even do that at all. The least thing possible you did not do. Verse 28, the master said, So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Verse 29, For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Verse 30, And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what do we see here? We see the story of three servants. The master is about to go in a long journey. He gives one five talents. He gives one two talents. He gives one one talent. We're told here that he gives them according to their ability. The one with the five talents got to work. He traded. He was busy about the master's business. He was using what the master had given him for the glory of the master, for the benefit of the master. And he had five more talents. The one with the two, who had two talents only. He didn't complain and say, but I only have two talents. He took what was given to him, the little that he had. He did something with it. And he got two more talents. Then the one that only had one. He did absolutely nothing. Instead, he went and buried. He hid the talent. The interesting thing is that we're told that the master came back after a long time. And that's a picture of the return of Christ. And they had to give an account. Now, here's what we have to understand. This passage is about believers. This passage is about those who refer to them as Christians, who call themselves Christians. And he's saying to, this is not about Christians and the outside world. This is about believers. Because we see here, he says what? He called his own servants. And gave them his money. But what's the context? The context of this message, of this passage, is that before that, in, verse, in Matthew 25, Christ had just shared the parable of the ten virgins. And he was, again, encouraging those who were listening to be ready for his return. He was encouraging them to be wise and not to be foolish because it's a passage of the, of the parable of the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins who were all waiting for the bridegroom, which is Jesus. And again, they are all believers. They are all virgins. They had lamps, but the difference is that the wise ones were ready and waiting for the bridegroom. They had oil in their lamps. They were walking by the power of the Spirit of God. They had a zeal and a fire for the things of God. So when the bridegroom arrived, they were ready and they were waiting. This is not believers and the world. This is people who call themselves Christians. But the foolish ones had no oil. They had no oil. So when the cry came out that the bridegroom was coming, they asked the wise ones to give them oil. And the wise ones said, look, if we give you oil, there will be nothing left for us. So the foolish virgins had to go and now buy oil. But we were too late. Because when the bridegroom returned, those who were ready and waiting for him, the wise virgins, were told that they went into the wedding feast with the bridegroom. By the time the foolish virgins arrived, we're told that the door was shut. And they cried and they begged to be let in. And verse 13 of Matthew 25 said, in fact, verse 11, it reads and says, Afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. Open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Verse 13, Christ says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. When we go back to verse 10, we see here that the foolish virgins are going to buy the oil. 
Verse 10 it says, and while, they were, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. It was too late. They were not ready. So they went to go get oil for their lamps. But while they went off to go try and get ready, it was too late. The bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to their wedding. And the door was shut. The door was shut. Remember, these are, these are, this, this is a picture of believers. People who call themselves Christians. It's not believers and the world. This is people who, who call themselves Christians. But some were ready and the others were not. Some were Christians by name only and not by heart. Some were walking by the power of the Holy Spirit, that is the oil, and the others were not. And the door was shut. And when the door was shut, they came back and saying, Lord, Lord, open to us, open to us, open to us. And he said, no. He said, I don't know you. And he warns us, he says, watch. Watch. For you don't know the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So, from verse 14 to 30 of Matthew 25, Christ then shifts focus. He says to us in the parable of the virgins that we should watch because we don't know what day or the hour he will return. From verse 14 to 30, he then shifts focus to what we must do and how we should be living as we await and watch for his return. In verse 14 to 30, he's trying to explain to us what our attitude must be, what our lives must be like as we watch and wait for his return or as we watch and wait either before we leave this world, whichever comes first. And the point of this passage is that as we watch and wait and as we live, that as believers we should be busy about the business of the Father. As we live in this life, we should be busy about the business of the Father and be asking ourselves regularly, how can I live for the glory of God? How can I bring glory to God's name today? How can I use what God has given me today in some shape or form to honor his name, to glorify his name, to reflect his light to the world? And very much like the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents that we're reading this morning is also about Christians. I said it's also about Christians. Verse 14, Matthew 25, verse 14, he says, For the kingdom of heaven... Is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants. His own servants. Okay? If we look at verse 18, what does it say to us? It says, But he had but he had but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. So very much like the parable of the virgins, this parable here is about believers. And the key lesson here, again, is as we watch and wait to be busy about the Father's business, to be living for, the, for His glory, to be asking how do we advance God's purposes and His, His agenda in this world? Because we have to give an account. We can't escape it. If we're going to have to give an account for every idle word that we speak, how much more how we use our resources, our talents, our time, our energy, our efforts. One of the things that we see in this parable of the talents is that God has given to all of us different gifts, different resources, different talents. But irrespective of the size or the magnitude of the talent he has given us, or the gifts he has given us, he expects us to be busy with it. He expects us to use it for something that will honor him. Because there is a purpose that he has ordained for the life of every human being that is on this earth. There is a reason why we are here. There is a purpose for which he has created us. 
and he has given us the, the, the talent and the energy and the resources and the gifts to fulfill that purpose. But ultimately, that purpose must somehow, in some way, bring glory back to God. Let's turn to Colossians 3.23. Colossians 3.23 It says, And whatever you do, do it heartily. That is, do it with all your heart, all your might, all your effort. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. In everything that we do, somehow, in some way, we have to find a way to link what we do, how we live our lives, where God has placed us to bring glory to his name. Whatever you do, do it heartily. Do it with all your heart and all your mind as to the Lord and not to men. Don't do things for men. Do it first for God. Knowing that from the Lord, what? You will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. So wherever God has placed us, whatever avenue or stream of life he has placed us, he has placed us there for a reason, to serve Christ, to glorify Christ. So whatever we do, we do it as unto God first and not man. And verse 17 of Colossians 3 says, again, and whatever you do, in word or in deed, whether you are speaking or whether you are acting, do all in that name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. God expects us, God expects us to use our lives for his glory. He expects us to be asking ourselves constantly, what can I do today to bring glory to God's name? What can I do today to reflect my love for God to others? How can I live today to show others the goodness of God and the love of God? Let's turn to Matthew 5, 16. Matthew 5, 16. Similar thing. Matthew 5, 16, where it says, Let your light so shine before men. Let your light so shine before men. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify who? Your Father in heaven. Your Father in heaven. That they may glorify your Father in heaven. So going back to our passage this morning, we see that the servants with the five and two talents, they went about and traded with the talents that the master had given them. They were busy and they used what was given them to try and expand what? The wealth and the assets of the master. And this is the picture of believers who out of love and devotion, I'm going to prove that this morning, is a picture, the, 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 the servants with the five and the two talents is a picture of believers who out of love and devotion to the master, who is Jesus, are using whatever God has given them. No matter how much or how little, whether it's their time, whether it's their energy, whether it's their resources, whether it's their money, their lives, they are using it in some shape or form. They are consciously and intentionally asking themselves, how can I use what God has given me to expand his kingdom, to glorify his name, to expand the gospel? And to bring honor to the name of Christ. That's the picture that we see here. And how do we know that what they were doing was out of love and devotion to the master? Because when we read verse 20 to 23, we see that the master is describing the servants with the five talents and the two talents that doubled their talents. He described them as good and faithful good and faithful. Matthew 25, 23. 
his Lord said to him, well done, what? Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you a ruler over much. Now, here's the thing. You can't have faithfulness without love. You can't be faithful to someone without, without love. So, so love must precede faithfulness. And faithfulness comes out, is, is shown in the actions of the person. But it starts from a heart of love and devotion. A very simple picture of marriage is a man and a woman are faithful to each other in the context of marriage. Why? Because they love one another. Where there is no love, there is no faithfulness. But where there is love, there is faithfulness. And that faithfulness is shown in the action of these servants who say, how can I please my master? How can I use what he has given me and, and, and increase his wealth, increase his assets to please him? Because they are faithful to him because they love him. Not the works in itself, but because they love him. We also know that the actions of these three servants had the source and motivation in how they felt about their master. When we read the words of the servant with the one talent. The words of the servant with the one talent makes it very clear that the origins of their action, before they did what they did, it began in their heart. Whether they decided to double the money or put the money to work or put their talents to work or not, it began from the heart. What does he say to us? He says here, Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. You look about it. He, he's calling his master a hard man. A master who had entrusted his, 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 his goods to him. A master who trusted him enough to give him the goods and say, look, I trust you. I trust you with my goods. I am giving you this. I trust you with it. But now he turns around. He calls his master a hard man. Reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there's what you, there's what, there you have what is yours. So what we see there is that he calls his master a hard man. And that's a picture of someone who calls themselves believers, but with no love or devotion to Christ. He tells his master, you reap where you have not sown and gather where you have not planted seed. He had no interest whatsoever in the master's business. So what did he do? He went and he hid and buried the talent in the ground. It shows an uncaring attitude, no love, no devotion, no interest, no trust, no faith. But it began from the heart. It started from the heart. His words reveal the condition of his heart. I knew you to be a hard man. He called himself a servant of the master, but deep in his heart, his thoughts and the condition of his heart to the master was not one of love or devotion. And that was manifested in his behavior and his actions. <clears throat> but here's the question we have to ask ourselves. And that question is that while the other two servants were busy about the master's business, while they were trying to find ways to increase their talents, while they were trying to find ways to please their master, right? The question that we have to ask ourselves is that what was this lazy and wicked servant busy doing? So we had the, they had a, you had the servant with the two talents running around trying to increase the talents to please his master. The, the servant of the five was running around trying to do the same thing. Okay? But what was the servant with the one talent? What was he busy doing? Because verse 19 tells us that the master came and settled accounts after a long time. So the master was away for a long time. And in that long time, the, the, the servant with the two talents and the five talents, they were busy about their master's business. 
So the one with the one, what was he busy doing? He was probably busy going about his own business, going about his own life. He had no interest, absolutely no interest in the things of the master. He was so focused on his own life, his own things, that he did not even consider doing the least possible thing, the least possible thing to increase the wealth of the master. Verse 26, the master says to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Verse 27, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers at the very least. The least you could have done was take my money, even if you don't, just take my money and put my money with the bankers. That's, that, that's the picture. The least you could have done. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. God expects us to be busy about his business. He expects us to be busy about his agenda. He expects us to be mindful about the question, what can we do to advance the purposes of God in this world, in this life? Because one day, after a long time or a short time, we have to appear and give an account. For some, it will be today. For others, it will be next week. Some it will be, some, some will be next month. Some it might even be tonight. Where their life is going to end and they have to give an account. What we see in the passage this morning is that the master had two very different responses to all three servants. Two very different responses to all three servants. To the other two, he said what? Well done. Well done. Good job. You have pleased me. I am happy with you. Well done. Then he calls them what? Good and faithful. Good and faithful. Then he says to them, enter into the joy of your Lord. That's what he says to them. Those who were busy about the work of the Father because they loved him. Not, not the work in itself, but because they loved him. They, uh, they realize what God has done for them. So they are busy about the business of the Father. It doesn't mean that they are about preaching every day, but wherever God has placed them, they are asking themselves, how can I use where God has placed me to advance his purpose? How can I use what God has given me to advance his agenda? So they are busy in some shape or form. E everything they do in their lives revolves around Christ and pleasing Christ. In some shape or form. So Lord sees that and says, well done. You have used the things I have given you to bring glory and honor to my name. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then you have the other one who did nothing. And the response of the same master is very different. The response of the master is very different. You wicked and lazy servant. Verse 28, he says, Take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Verse 29, For, et, for to everyone who has more will be given, and he who has and will have in abundance, but from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what the master is saying here, his responses are based on what the servants did with what the master had given them. And the origin of their actions 
and the source of their actions was whether they loved the master or not. It began from the heart. It began from the heart. It begins with the heart. When we read verse 29 to 30 as we start to round up, what we see is that it really focuses our attention on how we should live so that we can be profitable for the kingdom of God. The word that's used here in verse, verse 29 to 30, you see here, right? He says there, for to everyone who has, everyone who has, who has lived their lives for the glory of Christ because they love Christ, more will be given and he will have in abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. So if we stand before God and we have to give an account and we have nothing to show, what, if, what we think we have will be taken away from us. And he calls this servant unprofitable. He says, and cast the unprofitable servant. The servant was of no use. The servant squandered and wasted everything that God had given him. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. What we are seeing here is that those who love Christ more will do more for Jesus because they love him more. Those who love Christ more will do more for him because they love him more. And because they do more, they will be rewarded more. But again, remember, it's not about just the works in itself. The origin of their actions is from their devotion and their love and their commitment to the master. If they, had, if they went and doubled all the, all the talents and did not love the master, it is pointless. If they do all the good works without the love for the master, it is pointless. The works have to stem from the love for the master and faith for the master. So all the things that we do must originate out of a love for Christ and faith in him. And faith in him. While it's very clear from this passage that those who love him less or not at all will do less and do nothing at all. And because they do less or do nothing, because they have no real love, they receive no reward. Not only do they receive no reward, but they are thrown into the outer darkness where unrepented sinners and those who defy God are thrown. Why? Why would, why would the master do something so serious? Why would he cast his servant out into the outer darkness. Because even though that servant claimed to be a believer, even though that servant claimed to love the master, his life and his actions proved that he had no real love for the master. And the danger and why Christ shares this parable is to encourage us to look at our hearts. It's not enough in what we say. It's about our devotion, our commitment to the Lord. And that's why the master had the servant thrown into the outer darkness because his, his, his actions proved that he had no real love for the master. In fact, that is why the master called him what? Wicked, sir. Wicked. Not just lazy, but wicked. Meaning that the, the master showed him trust. The master gave him talent. But he responded by doing nothing. Because there was no love. So he, he responded to the master's trust with a lack of love, lack of devotion, lack of commitment. So the master called him wicked.
But the master called the other servants good and faithful. Good and faithful. Meaning that their lives and their actions, through what they did, it reflected the character of Christ, the goodness of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. And he called them faithful because their lives and their actions showed faith in Christ and faithfulness to Christ. That's why he called them good and faithful. Because they loved the Lord, they allowed the Spirit of God to do the work in their hearts, in their lives, and therefore their lives reflected the character of God, the goodness of God, and the righteousness of God. Not their own. And he called them faithful because they, had, they showed faith, they were demonstrating faith in Christ, faith in God, and faithfulness to God. It was their faithfulness to God because of their love to God that allowed them to do what they did, and they were rewarded for it. But it's only possible, it's only possible to be good and faithful if Jesus is our first love. That's the only way. It's not about our goodness or our works or our faithfulness. It's only possible to be good and faithful in the eyes of God if Jesus is our first love. And how do we make him our first love? We must regularly think about what the Lord has done for us. We must think about what the Lord has done for us. A wise person is a person who sits down and thinks and remembers the goodness of God. A wise person is a person who sits down and plays back regularly the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God. A wise person is a person that sits down and plays back the mercy of God over their lives. Because the more they do that, the more they see the faithfulness of God, the love of God towards them, the grace of God towards them, and that would change their action and their lives. But the foolish person is the person who doesn't think about what God has done for them. His faithfulness, His goodness, His mercy. We can only make Jesus our first love when we constantly live in the context of eternity. It doesn't end in this life. It doesn't end here. And it is a very difficult thing for the human mind to understand, to comprehend. But the truth is that it doesn't end here. For some people, I said, for some people, their eternity is going to start in 30 minutes. For some people, their eternity is going to start in one hour. For some people, it is tonight. For some, it is tomorrow. For some, it is next week. For some, it is next year. But for every one of us, a day is going to come. And so we have to live in the context and the reality of that eternity. To say, as we live and we enjoy what God has blessed us with in this life, and we must enjoy them. We must, because he blesses us with good things. But as we live in this life and do what we are supposed to do and enjoy his blessings, how do we live in the context of eternity? Because when we, when, we, when we think that way, it will reorientate all our actions and bring everything into context and sharp focus. But here's the truth as I close. The truth is that all of us, every single one of us, have at some point been like the good and faithful servant. We've served the Lord with joy. We've been zealous. We've been about the Father's business. The other truth is that all of us, at certain times as well, have also been like the wicked and lazy servant. All of us, without exception, every single one of us. And we are guilty. Why? Because very often God gives us so much. He blesses us so much. He's so faithful to us. He's shown us the ultimate display of his love through his son, Jesus, upon the cross. But how do we sometimes respond? Sometimes we don't respond to God with the same love. We don't respond to him back with the same devotion. 
we're not faithful to him even though he has been faithful to us and so the interest for the things of God the interest for his agenda and his purpose takes second place in our lives all of us all of us well here's the good news Christ is our high priest and he intercedes for us and this morning what the word is doing is that God is calling each and every one of us back he is calling us back he is asking us to recommit our devotion to him the Lord is asking us to recommit our devotion to Him. He's asking us to rededicate, to rekindle our love for Him. He is asking us to show greater interest and zeal for the purposes of God in this life because we will have to give an account. We have to give an account. God is calling us back this morning not to condemn us. I'm, God is not calling us to condemn us. Christ is sharing these parables about servants. He's trying to make us understand. He's trying to make us make sure that we know where we stand so that we don't become deceived. So he's not telling us this morning these things to condemn us. He's telling us to guide us, to guide us to help us that we might examine our own hearts so that we will end up like the good and faithful servant. God's intention is that everyone who calls themselves a believer will end up like the good and faithful servant and not like the wicked servant. That's his intention. And that's why we have these parables in scripture. That we can shine the light of this word onto our own hearts and say, Lord, where am I lacking? Father, where I have not shown love, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, where I have been weak in my love, Lord, give me zeal. Lord, where I have been unfaithful, Father, make me faithful. Where I have had no interest, Father, create a zeal and an interest in me. Father, where I have been unprofitable, Lord, make me profitable. Because they will either be profitable servants or unprofitable servants. There is no middle ground. And the danger is that we sort of live life thinking there is a middle ground. There is no middle ground. There is none. And God shares this with us because he loves us. In fact, when we read Revelation 3, 19, what does Christ say? Lord, the Lord warns. He chastises those that he loves. Not condemnation. He tells us these things out of love. So that we can be ready and be prepared and be watching. Because there will be no excuse on that day. None. No excuse. Revelations 3.19. Revelation, sorry, Revelation 3.19. When Christ is addressing the, the lukewarm church. In Laodicea, a church that had backslidden, a church that was lukewarm, a church that had more interest in the things of this life than the things of God, even after he had scolded them, he called them back to himself. He called them back to himself. He didn't, he didn't cast them away. That's the compassion of Jesus. He didn't cast them away. Let's read it from verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen and the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, that is Christ, the beginning of the creation of God. Verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you could, I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So he hasn't done it yet. He will do it if they don't repent. 
But because you say, I am rich, I become wealthy, and have no need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you. So he's, he's, he's criticized them, he's chastised them, right? He's rebuked them. That's actually the word. He has rebuked them. Then he goes on to say in verse 18, I counsel you, I advise you to buy from me, come back to me, gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, spiritually rich, rich towards God. In other words, the things of this life. And white garments, that is purity, that you may be clothed and no more naked, that your shame, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So even though he has rebuked them, he is calling them back to himself. He's not throwing them away, he's not casting them away. He's calling them back to himself. Verse 19, he says, As many as I love, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase them. So it's those that I love, those that I care about, that I rebuke. And I chasten them, I correct them, so that they can make right, they can be aligned, because I love them. My intentions for them are good, so I want them to realign their lives, to be repentant, so they can inherit the promise that awaits them. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase them. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Therefore, be zealous and repent. God is calling us back this morning not to condemn us. I want to make that absolutely clear. But to convict us that we may be ready he said, no one knows the day or the hour. We may die today, tonight, tomorrow, or Christ may return. We don't know. We don't know. So he's saying to us, be zealous. Be zealous about the things of God. Be zealous about living a life for God. Be zealous about opening up your life so that it may be used for the glory of God. And repent. So Christ wants us to be like the good and faithful servant. So in closing, three questions that we must all ask ourselves. Three questions. God has given you talent. He's giving you a gift of life. He's giving you resources, energy, above all life. Life is giving you life. He's breathed his, his spirit into you. His life is inside of you and me. The question is, how are we using that gift of life for his glory? Are we even interested in using that gift for his glory? How are we using that gift for his glory? Where God has placed us, how are we using our life, wherever he's placed us, to manifest the goodness of God, the glory of God, the light of Christ, to those around us, to bring glory to his name? Second question. In what context are we living our lives in? Are we living our lives in the context of this world alone? That will pass away? Or are we living our lives in the context of eternity that is real, that is never ending? Are we living our lives for finite things or for infinite things? Are we living our lives for earthly things and worldly things or divine and eternal things? Because eternal things are real, they are more real than this life because they will never pass away. They will never end. And thirdly, and ultimately, on the day that you and I stand before the Lord, 
and have to give an account of everything that we have done of every resource he has given us our time our energy our efforts on the day we have to stand before the throne of Christ and explain ourselves and give an account and settle accounts what are the words that we want to hear him say to us I believe in fact I know that those words of Christ are the most important words that any soul will ever hear forget whatever you might have heard in your life when we stand before Jesus and he utters those words those words will be the most important words that any soul has ever heard in their life because once those words are uttered it will determine the eternal destiny of that soul and there is no coming back from those words there is no appeal from those words there is no begging from those words there is no excuse once those words are uttered so this morning Christ urges us to come back to be zealous because his intentions for us are good and not for evil because he loves us with an undying love so we have to ask ourselves what are the words I want to hear from Jesus when I stand before him let's pray